this hasn't been previously talked about much because the original Greek gives the colours of the horses as red, white, black and green. Green translated for the most part in the English as grey. When Kelly has a vision of the 24 elders, these are the 24 elders of the apocalypse. The world of Enochian is essentially an apocalyptic clock counting very much down to midnight. Even in the alchemical work of Dee, where they seek to turn lead into gold, it is because they see the book of nature in a state of corruption. The world is disintegrating into decay, and their alchemy is an attempt to fix this. Okay. For Dee, though, there was a hope that these terrifying events could presage a new golden age, and the angels would lay out a battle plan for him for a new Jerusalem. There was a real urgency and a relevance for the work that Dee was doing, which was growing out of the world he was living in. And this is how magic should be, something which is engaged in the culture which is around it, rather than languishing as a somewhat sidelined subculture. Dee chose to act rather than being frozen by normalcy bias or by cortisol introducing fear. He shifted from a position of simply a commentator to becoming an active angelic prophet in the line of Enoch. In 1583, Events continued to take turns for the worst. Jupiter and Saturn were co-joining in Pisces, marking the end of a 960-year cycle. There were very real fears that this was the end of the world, or at the very least, the Catholic Church. Robert Tanner announced that the conjunction doth marvellously agree with the famous prophets of Elias and many other places of scriptures of the latter day of the world and the destruction to be near at hand and the coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to judgment will not be long. Jupiter and Saturn would then enter the fiery trigon in May 1584 with a mass conjunction in Aries with every visible planet except the Sun. The heavens were aflame with significance for the people of the Middle Ages. Prediction and prophecy became ripe. Both in England and on the continent, a date was set. 1588, the likely end of the world. Dee knew this. 1588 was the date of Dee and Kelly's cross-matching experiment and their final apocalyptic vision in their work together. Dee's personal tower revealed not the Christ in the clouds predicted by the Gospel, but the cloud-shrouded morning star, the daughter of fortitude. This is one of the most holy texts for those seeking after Babylon and rife with apocalyptic symbolism. 1588 was the last year of Dee and Kelly's work together. 1588 was the date of Elizabeth's triumph over the invincible Armada. But the end of the world didn't come. There was no return of Christ, no golden age, no Jura woodcut apocalypse. Dee simply dwindled into old age and poverty. Kelly, in legend at least, dies from the injuries of jumping out of another tower. So perhaps Dee was as deluded by the signs in the heavens as by his intricate game with the angels and his intermeshing gears of stacked hierarchies and interlocking crosses. And we can read similar frightening signs in the skies above our culture. We just have to glimpse them through a mirror occluded with more smog and light pollution, something thankfully lacking in the highlands. For our comet, we have Hale Bob. For our fiery trigon, we've had our grand alignment. For 1588, 
we have 2012 for our Black Death. We have swine flu, Ebola, AIDS. For the crisis in the Catholic Church, we have the loss of faith in the American Empire and consumer capitalism. So perhaps we're as wrong, perhaps we're as wrong as uh, D was. There are certainly many parallels that we can draw between Dee's world and our own. There are particular stories which seem to replay through the lives and the actions of these individuals. Kelly and Dee being retold with Jack Parsons and Lauren Hubbard. The daughter of Fortitude finally revealing herself as Babylon triumphant, casting off the previous veils of Inanna, Ishtar, Astarte and Aphrodite. Is there then perhaps an occult secret of eternal recurrence of conflicts playing out in different costumes with different actors recast in the colours of their own age. Are we all here players in the game of Dean Kelly, of Ishtar and Tamas, of Babylon and Beast? Is the story more urgent now? Is the frequency rising to a pitch where it will dislodge the masonry and finally bring down the Royal Arch? Or is there rather an apocalyptic longing, a thanatos which affects all ages and all men in all times, matching the force for apocalypse denial, an equal and opposing force which creates a need for apocalypse, a desire for the destruction of things to parallel our own passionate dramas of incarnation, of love and longing. I would argue that there is this morning, but it's not for apocalypse, it is for liberation. But utter liberation requires utter annihilation and the lightning path to enlightenment. And everyone will undergo this apocalypse, but only the few in secret will alchemize it into gold. I'd also suggest that Dee was right, that for the Gnostic, the end of the world is always nigh. Not in the sense of the sandwich board wearing paranoids, but rather in an ecstatic awareness of life cusping with death in every moment, of living with fullness. But there is a further and more worrying possibility that the angels spoke truthfully, that the end really was nigh in the Middle Ages, and that terrible flower is ready to bloom in our own midst, a mere Algenblick since then. Just as when we move to the heart of a rose, the petals are more tightly furled, time is speeding up as we close on the mystery, the singularity, the omega point, the grail, Apocalypsis in the original Greek means the concealed, revealed. An image not of Mary or chaste Isis, but of Babylon, the whore coupled with the seven-headed beast, the beloved risen from hell. I am absolutely convinced that Apocalypse is upon us. And I want to share that with you so that we can all choose to live with passionate intensity. Time is running out for humanity. In the West, this story is often told in the cultural symbols we find encoded in the Revelation of St. John. Being able to see through that particular text will not save us from the ensuing disaster, but it may set us free from some of the traps. In the years since writing The Red Goddess, the world has irrevocably changed. We're not at the end of history, so myopically predicted by Francis Fukuyama, his normalcy bias expecting liberal capitalist democracy to be the final and enduring Reich. Instead, we're at the end of nature and the end of humanity descending into an increasingly fascistic squabble 
for the few remaining of resources. When the Abramaic God gave his people the right to exploit every resource on the planet, he forgot to mention that it was a finite. 